Hello, participants. Um, you're very welcome um, to this second webinar um, hosted by NHS England on continuity of carer. We're hoping that um, you're all connected well, everybody can hear, um, be it uh, connecting through your PC or a telephone. My name is uh, Jackie Dunkley Ben, and I'm Head of Maternity, Children and Young People at NHS England. I'm just going to run through some preliminary um, pointers before we get on to the really exciting stuff and introduce our, our key speakers for this webinar. So you're all very welcome. This is the second uh, webinar in a series of webinars that we'll be conducting this year. Um, thanks very much for all of you who are dialing in today and for those that dialed in in the first webinar, webinar back in December. Um, unfortunately, we only have capacity for 125 people. These webinars have been exceptionally popular and oversubscribed um, last time and this time. So because we only have capacity for 125, if you have a friend or a colleague that is struggling to dial in, could you share your device with them? I'll now take a little moment to set out what's coming up in this month's episode. So. Uh, we have, um, uh, as I say, uh, key speakers, uh, Sarah Noble and Michelle Waterfall. Um, uh, Claire Matthews, my deputy job share, will introduce them in more detail shortly. But they will be presenting on exploring the workforce. We'll have Q&A um, led by Jana Richen and colleagues, and we will summarize um, and then have next steps. So first of all, and just to start of a turn, it would be remiss of me if I didn't um, mention uh, the NHS long-term plan that was uh, published uh, by NHS England on Monday. And um, as you know, from pages uh, 44 onwards, we have um, maternity midwifery very well represented in the plan, in the long-term plan. This will take us up to the next um, uh, decade, um, uh, 80th birthday of the NHS, which um, will mean that our maternity services will look demonstrably different to how they look now. In that plan, um, and in keeping with the theme of this webinar, we have um, reference to continuity of care. There will be no surprises to many of you in that regard. This time, naturally, in the plan on page uh, 40, uh, 48, uh, we talk about the uh, ambition. Uh, um, previously espoused by Better Birth uh, recommendation that most women should have continuity of carer uh, by 2021. And in between now and then, there are leaders and incentives to support maternity providers to get to that most. And as you know, on the table at the moment, we have planning guidance that uh, um, suggests that maternity providers, uh, LMSs, should be up 20%. Um, offering continuity of carer uh, by March 19. And if I can be very specific, women booked onto the continuity of carer pathway in March 2019, this March. And, but very specifically in the long term plan, we make reference to um, proportionate universalism whereby uh, continuity of carer will be received uh, or focused towards those who are in greatest need, so socioeconomically disadvantaged and women from black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups, those women who are more likely to experience morbidity and mortality. But nonetheless, we cannot ignore, ignore the um, 2021 ambition for most women to have continuity of care. So I'm not going to say anything more about um, the um, NHS long-term plan. Other than that, um, I'm now going to hand you over to Claire Matthews, uh, Deputy Job Chair, who's now going to take us through the rest of the webinar. Good morning, everybody. My name's Claire Matthews, and I'm one of two uh, Deputy Heads of Maternity working with uh, Jacqueline. And um, my uh, counterpart, who's also with us, is Jana Richens. And um, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping things before we actually start the webinar properly so that uh, we, we don't have any technical issues, hopefully, throughout the session. So first and foremost, we need to just clarify and make sure that you're all connected to audio. And if you can't hear anything now, go to the quick start button on your screen to be connected to audio. 
Can you then use your laptop speakers or WebEx? We'll call you back on your phone if you enter your number, or you can dial in if you've already done so using the number provided. We hope that this is an interactive session. Therefore, please add any questions or thoughts into the chat box as we go through the presentation and send messages to the host so that we can collect them as we go along. Questions will then be selected for answer by our panel for the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Don't worry if anybody can't make the session or hasn't been able to log on because the webinar is being recorded and will be available to download in the coming days. If you're having any technical problems, please send a message to the host via the chat panel. So firstly, a quick recap of the first webinar and what we discussed before we move on to today's subject. We know, as Jacqueline has already mentioned, um, that Better Birth says that we need to have 20% of women booked onto the services, maternity services, to receive continuity carer by March 2019. We also know that from Better Birth, it tells us that this really should be in the form of small teams of four to eight midwives. We also looked at continuity of carer and the evidence, particularly the evidence from Sandra Letal and the Cochrane Review in 2016, where it shared that 24% of uh, are less likely, women are less likely to have a preterm delivery. 15% less likely to uh, have an epidural, and 16% less likely to lose their baby if they experience uh, continuity of carer. Uh, we saw policy being put into practice through the national visit, and I'm absolutely delighted to say that we have 99% of providers, and over 100%, uh, the whole 100% of all the LMSs were engaged in that road trip, and it was really exciting and um, inspiring for us as a national team. We noticed and uh, shared last time the frequently recurring things that we picked up as part of that, uh, that road trip, which included multiple births, high-risk births, diabetes, uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, bereavement, elective cesarean section pathways, and also, as already mentioned, the vulnerable and socioeconomically deprived. And then we had a fabulous uh, presentation from Leslie Page, uh, where she talks about the importance to both the mother and the midwife of relational continuity. So the monitoring and evaluation framework tells us how we can deliver continuity of carer. And it states in that document that there are two main models to meet the principles to consider for local implementation. The first one being team continuity, and the second being full case loading. But it's really important to remember that neither of these need to be operated in their pure form, and they can be mixed. Both models can operate with a buddy system, whereby each woman has a first and alternative appointment of contact within the team. A hub and spoke model, where each team is a self-determining unit in its own right, supported by a central hub, which ensures a robust governance framework around them, and where possible, be implemented in both the hospital and the community settings. The monitoring and evaluation framework also clarifies the definitions of what a lead midwife is, a buddy midwife is, and a team midwife. And I'm not going to go through it um, totally these definitions, but just to really pick out that the lead midwife is the named midwife assigned to the woman and really should be the person who's met her throughout the pregnancy most times. The buddy midwife is the first choice for the replacement if the lead midwife is not available, and the team is the rest of the group of midwives that the, the woman has met in her pregnancy that will be available if neither the lead or the buddy midwife is available. So it's important to acknowledge some of the things that we heard whilst we were on our road trip that are particularly pertaining to uh, how we implement uh, continuity of care from a workforce perspective. And we heard that some, some midwives and services across the country have experienced of having been there and done that and shared widely experience with us around changing childbirth and perceived at the time uh, negative uh, connotations from that experience. But it's really important to link back to uh, the learning from the 80s and 90s and make sure that we do 
absolutely learn from it and make sure that this time is really different. One of the key things that Jackie's already shared with us is around uh, the, in the long-term plan with the new emphasis to really be on socio-economically deprived women and uh, black and ethnic minority women. The women that we know have the higher in index of risk within their pregnancy. So one of the things that was noted in the last round of, of, of this kind of work was that there was a focus on lower risk and need. And it was felt that this meant that some women got a gold standard care. Uh, and therefore, it made it easier to justify ending the scheme. However, although it could be said that this is the same situation, what I would say is that this is readdressing the balance and ensuring that by targeting such vulnerable and uh, women that have, we know are going to have poorer outcomes, as we saw in the Embrace report recently, <laughs> that it redresses the balance and gives them the opportunity to have the same outcomes as everyone else. We had lack of evaluation last time, and we didn't have any empirical evidence to show us um, at the evidence of how, why we needed to keep this going. And obviously, we are ensuring that this is happening this time. Teams and caseloads became too large, and a lot of services were unable to provide continuity of care, and it became watered down, and therefore another reason to disband, uh, abandon the service. There were some unreasonable demands, and some midwives were expected to cover the rest of the service when the labor ward was busy, and this led in some to burnout. But I think it's really important to note and to acknowledge that this wasn't actually a product of the, the model or a continuity of terror, but it was actually more a model issue in relation to leadership and management and business continuity, where people were pulled in appropriately to cover the internal workings of the hospital. Lack of support and teamwork and a Demino's culture, which I'm sure every midwife on the line is aware of, but at times we forget that we're all midwives and we're all here for the same uh, point, which is to care for the woman and her baby. And this really helps to consider the approach that we are moving forward with now. So my first tip really is to think about engaging with staff. And I, on this slide, it really shows you all the different things uh, or two of the different things that are available to share with staff at the moment. Pages 7 to 11 of the RCM's Can Continuity Work for Us is really fabulous at deflating the elephants in the room. And it's great to use as a tool to engage with your staff to help them see that it may not be a negative thing to, to offer this. Turning that on its head, what's really excellent to see is the work that came out from Birmingham University and Dr. Beck Taylor in Better Birth and Continuity, the Midwife Survey, where it showed that 35% of midwives are actually already now willing and ready, waiting to start offering continuity of carer, and with more wanting to do that in the future. So these are examples of how you might engage your staff and how you might encourage people to become involved. And so as we said on our road trip, it's really important to harness uh, those willing to try. And finally from me, uh, just to, again, this slide showing all the um, relevant guidance and support that is out there in a documentation form, implementing better birth, the monitoring and evaluation framework, the recent RCM uh, position statement on continuity of care, carer, the iLearn module, the study from Birmingham, and obviously the local transformation hub, which has a dedicated page for continuity of carer. I'm now going to hand you over to Sarah Noble, who I'm delighted to introduce to you as the Head of Midwifery at South Warwickshire NHS Foundation Trust, and her Deputy Head of Midwifery, Michelle Waterfall. And they're here to talk about their experience of exploring the challenges, the workforce and operational challenges of a whole system approach at their service in South Warwickshire. Welcome, Sarah and Michelle. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Claire, thanks very much for uh, that introduction. 
Um, so this morning, um, we just wanted to share with you our experience to date, really. I think first and foremost, I'd like to say we don't have all the answers. Um, and it has been and continues to be, you know, quite a roller coaster um, of a journey, an exciting one, and we're certainly on the right uh, road. Um, but I think at the moment, if I just give you a little brief background about um, South Warwickshire, uh, we are in Coventry and Warwickshire LMS. Um, so we are partnered with uh, UHCW, Coventry University Hospital, and George Eliot. At South Warwickshire, we have just under 3,000 uh, births per year. And we decided, you know, in line with the vision in Better Birth, to go for a system-wide approach. So that really is laying the foundations across our community service in order to be able to meet the aspiration of offering continuity of carer to the majority of women. Uh, we began the first rollout um, across five hubs in July um, and the second in November. So we are, at the moment, achieving 13.2% continuity of carer and are on track with our next two hubs uh, to achieve 26% by uh, the beginning of March uh, this year. But what I wanted, what I hope really will be helpful this morning is to really sort of go into a little bit more nitty gritty of the operationalization of this because it is a huge transformation and I think something that I've really underestimated myself. And what seemingly seems quite simple, you know, within our model, we are fundamentally moving our midwives from GP services out into our five main family hubs. Um, and we do have some satellite hubs because we cover quite a large rural area as well. Um, how, you know, when you, when you listen to that, it doesn't sound very complex. But actually, the first picture, you know, that you're looking at is sort of broken it down and about seven different um, sort of work streams. So we just wanted to go through each of them. They all interlink. It isn't in any sort of particular order. But I think when we are sort of planning the work that we're doing and looking at the next phase, you know, we tend to sort of use these, um, these now become sort of mini projects, really, in themselves in order to support the whole transformation. Uh, so to start with the culture and leadership, uh, clearly, we have a very clear uh, vision set uh, through uh, Better Birth and um, NHS England. It's been reiterated in the NHS England long-term plan. But it's taking that really and looking, you know, our first step was really looking at, you know, how are we going to implement this at a local level? You know, what do our community need? What's the resource we have in terms of, you know, the skill? Um, so we set out a vision, um, an aspiration, but locally, um, and I'll talk about how we did that when we come on to the um, engagement. Um, the other fundamental thing, one of the key stakeholders, um, and this has been invaluable really, particularly when we've encountered bumps, and we have encountered many, is having the support of the executive team. Um, and I think we feel very fortunate, you know, we work in a very uh, positive uh, cultural sort of environment, have got great support from our exec team who have been with us, you know, every step of the uh, journey. This is really important that you've got the execs on board because the first thing that I asked for um, before starting this implementation was the 10% uplift in the staff. This was based, we did a um, review with um, Birth Rate Plus and that's what they showed that we needed. Um, so that was a huge amount of money uh, that we were asking for, but nevertheless, we were able to demonstrate you know, why we needed those staff in order to be able to continue with this transformation work. So that was approved um, in April last year. I'm fairly new, head of midwifery. I've been in post now for 16 months. Uh, one of the other things I have looked at you know, was the structure of the maternity services. When I came in, it was a very flat structure. Um, so part of that staffing review was looking at, you know, who I needed in what uh, role. So the maternity structure has changed um, sort of enormously and, it's, and created sort of new posts. 
what I didn't sort of put in place at the beginning, and I suppose that's my top tip at the end really, was really relying on, you know, my senior team to lead this transformation. And that very quickly became apparent that that wasn't going to be sustainable because the projects were moving at such a pace. Um, and one of the things that I did sort of um, in the middle of last year, um, a project we started in September, was to get a non-clinical um, project lead, really, you know, somebody that's able to sort of stand back from the everyday um, running of the service and ensure, you know, that they, all the projects, you know, the seven projects that we've got sort of running are on track uh, to deliver. Certainly, I'm passionate about this. I was on the panel for Better Birth, and I very much, you know, am leading this, um, and it takes up an enormous amount of my time as head of midwifery. And I'm only able to do that because I have got, you know, Michelle that sat next to me here, you know, as deputy head of midwifery, who really, because I'm focused on the strategic delivery, is running the intensive service <laughs> at uh, South Warwickshire, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, supported by the senior team, um, and I think that works okay. Just to be sure. But I think it's really clearly, you know, identifying in your team, you know, where your strengths are, you know, who who who's doing what. Um, so yes, very much. You know, on the next slide, which is the implementing uh, the new model. Uh, as I say, we've got a system-wide approach, so five main hubs, we've got um, four satellite clinics, and the majority of those in the rural areas, because delivering continuity of care in rural, air, in rural areas is different to urban areas. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, because I think we could probably do a whole WebEx just on, <laughs> on that in itself. Um, but our model is we are bringing cohorts of women um, together who are roughly sort of um, expecting their babies at the same time, and they are looked after by two midwives, you know, all the way through um, their pregnancy. Um, so in terms of, um, we have decided to focus strategically on starting this with low-risk women. The reason for that is you know, when we look at our skill mix, um, predominantly, this service was being delivered by our community midwives who are experts in looking after women with healthy pregnancies. Um, and, but a lot of them hadn't actually done very much intrapartum care over the last five years. You know, some, I mean, it really varies. Some midwives had come out of the main unit, but some long standing community midwives have perhaps had four or five births in the last five years. So, you know, there was, you know, a competent feed, you know, we needed to build on that sort of competence, but really confident, um, so that midwives felt confident, you know, to deliver that service. So, low risk uh, women is about a third of our total population. So, in terms of the caseload mix, based on uh, the birth rate plus ratio, the community midwives carry um, about a third, which is the low risk, and the other is uh, the more complex pregnancy. And I've got further, if people want to look at that calculation, having worked out the case load, I'm happy to share it. I haven't included it in this presentation, um, but it works out to be 1 to 60. I think it's also worth mentioning at this point that we were fortunate enough to open our new uh, midwifery-led um, birth unit um, in July, which also times with the beginning of our first hub. Um, so that gave us um, a really good foundation to start working with women in that low risk environment um, and, and getting the staff to rotate into the birth center to become um, more confident and competent in the intrapartum skills. Yeah, and as Michelle says, that was absolutely fundamental actually because the business case was agreed for the middle free led unit. Uh, we have money allocated for staff for the middle free led unit, but instead of staffing the building, we use that pool of money to actually put that resource straight out into the community. Um, so over the last year, the community, just to give you a feel, you know, we're quite a small unit. The community midwives have gone up from 19 
full-time equivalents, the 35. Um, but that is because they are actually now delivering a third of the intraclassy care. Um, if we go on to the engagement and communication, I can't stress really this, I think this is probably my personal uh, learning through delivering this transformation work is that I cannot sort of stress the importance of the engagement and the communication. Um, certainly the project team and myself personally spend between 60 and 80 percent of my time on this aspect because it is it's just enormous, um, but it really pays um, dividends. Um, so, who are we engaging with? You know, it's the LMS board. You know, this pilot is part of the um, LMS plan. Women and families working with our maternity board partnership. Our health visitors are very much working um, with how we are going to be delivering our sort of public health um, aspects around um, antenatal education. Our primary care colleagues and uh, commissioners. Now, these probably in terms of engagement is where we didn't do so well. We thought, you know, that we had adequately engaged with primary care. But on reflection, we should, could have done more. We are doing more, and that's certainly the learning going forward. Um, we started really by writing to all GPs, letting them know the changes, um, going to their sort of central meetings, the members' council to do presentations, and had sort of written little articles in their newsletters. Um, but that really wasn't enough. Uh, what we have found is that, you know, actually we need to do that face-to-face. -face. Um, so we've got 37 GP practices in our patch, um, and we're working through them. But, but it's a bit like the journey that you guys went on around the UK. <laughs> we feel like we're doing that round Warwickshire now. <laughs> So that really has paid um, dividends. I think we had a lot of um, you know, the GPs initially weren't very happy about it. They felt that you know, midwives coming out of GP surgeries were a loss. They were enjoyed, you know, had good relationships with their uh, midwives. So it was assuring them that you know those relationships are absolutely fundamental uh, to um, midwives and women and their health going forward and we want you know, to ensure that you know, we have that going forward, but we just need to do it you know, in a different way. And uh, you know, through sort of explaining to GPs the other benefits of you know, working out of the family hub, you know, working very closely, being in the same physical space as health visitors, as the perinatal mental health team, as family support workers, um, and the GPs very quickly sort of came on board because they could see you know, the benefits to women and uh, families. Um, but it is actually working through the practicalities um, of you know, moving from GPs uh, out into the hub that things like um, obviously women make all their appointments through the receptionist. You know, when you're in hub, we don't have reception staff, referrals were picked up from uh, GPs, uh, blood was sent by GPs. So all these operational things, we have to look at how we were going to do that from the uh, family hub. So what we've done with the GPs is really get them involved in the change. So now, you know, going manually into the GP hub to pick up referrals, you know, every couple of days is really not workable. So we've looked at, we've just created an electronic system where women can actually self-refer, they can refer themselves and maternity services from home. Um, but we've got some key GPs involved in looking at that IT and working with us, you know, what do they think, you know, about it, um, which I think is really sort of helped that relationship. Um, of course, there are many more um, stakeholders now for the midwives to engage with on a daily basis, including the children's centres, uh, managers, Within our sort of five main hubs, then, although they're all centrally run by Warwickshire County Council, they are actually managed by visit organisations, you know, such as Bernardi's and Parenting Project. So it's not one size fits all in terms of the community hubs. It's actually working with those individual managers in those hubs, um, which you know we are now doing in a set up sort of regular uh, regular meeting. Uh, the engagement I think that went really well was actually the engagement that we did with 
staff, uh, Michelle, you were certainly um, very involved in that, and it wasn't just engaging, you know, with the community staff, um, but who were actually going to be initially delivering the continuity of care, but it was actually getting, you know, the other staff um, mm. in the acute setting on board. Yeah, I think put, putting the teams together to talk about it in a common environment with everybody together um, was really key. Um, obviously, people kind of can work in silo, and there can be that sort of them and us culture um, from a community uh, and an acute setting. So it was really important to bring those two teams together um, in, in the engagement process so they can you know, kind of hear each other's concerns and, and talk about it as one team. And it's very much um, the way that we are talking about our workforce now is as one team um, rather than it being you know, based in clinical, different clinical areas. Um, and actually that gives you the ability to be more responsive to the, um, the needs of the women. Uh, it, and rather than being um, responsive to each clinical area. Um, those sessions went on for yeah, quite a while. We wanted to try and touch base with as many people as possible. Um, but I think one of the things that we've probably learned again on reflection of um, things to improve on is once we started with the implementation of the hubs, um, a lot of the engagement were, was with the teams who were obviously um, going to be making the model work um, in the hub setting, um, and we weren't discussing as much in the um, acute setting. And I think if we had our time again, we would continue having the constant conversations um, with the whole team um, in all of the clinical areas, because I think it can, it can become siloed and people can kind of forget what's happening out there and the challenges that the, the teams are facing. Um, but also, a lot of our um, staff now are talking about um, kind of workforce and, and planning, and we'll, we'll come on to that slightly in, in a moment. But it's having your team almost prepared that this, this is how it, it is going to be, and as more, um, more women we're offering continuity to, at the moment, yes, it's low risk, but we also have that aspiration to look at how we can um, implement this for women in our you know, consultant-led clinics and higher risk categories, the socioeconomic groups, and how we can implement that. And obviously, that will shift the workload completely, and, and the staff need to be aware of, of where we are with, with the journey and, and how that is going to, to come about and, and the changes that are going to be coming. But at the workforce, we see the biggest transformation. We've taken the workforce with us every step of the way um, and really have kept them at the heart of everything that we do so that they've been engaged and listened to. And certainly, you know, although we had a broad vision, you know, how we were going to achieve it, we really have no idea, you know, <laughs> and, and said that. But I think what we knew really to make this work is whatever model we went for, we needed the majority of the workforce that were prepared to work in that way. For me, that was absolutely critical in order to be able to, you know, achieve it for the majority of women and to scale it up. Um, and so, you know, it was the workforce, you know, through those work, um, those workshops that we did that came up with a model, you know, so we did the team approach, we had various off duties, um, you know, how off duties, you know, rolling off duties, um, you know, different patterns of off duty. Um, so they were really involved in the detail of how those off duties uh, we're going to work because fundamentally that's what staff, you know, that's what really matters yeah, that on absolutely. the ground is, is getting that kind of work-life balance. Um, we've done a lot of work with our teams going live. Um, because the hub is so different, you know, one size will not fit, fit all and really for it to be successful, the teams really need to be very autonomous. They need to be able to work in an autonomous way but it's actually supporting the team to have those skills, you know, to work in that way. And we have employed an external consultant, which we funded through some of the transformation monies that we got through the LMS, to work with the team to look at um, communication in teams, mm -hmm. to look at how they manage their meetings, who's responsible for what in each team. So some of the team members are responsible for um, looking at, you know, what they're achieving, what continuity uh, they're achieving, and what their outcomes are. 
And it's sort of really, I can see it's still, it's still very early days, but I can see that sort of organically building where the team are much more engaged with, you know, what difference they are making as a team. Absolutely. Um, and there is a little bit of people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so if we can go on to the hub. The touched on is it, it's all sort of, um, sort of interlinked. Um, but some of the practicalities around uh, the hub, again, you know, certainly for me, this is all very new. Um, you know, having to agree, agree sort of local uh, service level agreements, again, you know, with different sort of providers. One of the hubs, um, we do need to have physical um, adaptations uh, made to, um, in order for that uh, facility to be fit for purpose. Um, so that's, again, is the bump that we've hit. Um, we were hoping that we would be delivering continuity of care on that hub in April, but the work, you know, which will be undertaken by the council aren't going to be starting, I still don't have a date, but sometime between May and August. So it's actually dealing with the impact of that, because effectively we've got two models, you know, running side by side for longer than we would have um, liked, um, you know, and the workforce implications um, of that. Um, one of the things I didn't I sort of come back to touching on the workforce, when we mapped out looking at, you know, how many midwives do we actually need to deliver continuity of care, I was quite convinced when we set out on the journey that on paper that I didn't need any more midwives um, and that we could make it work within, you know, the birth rate recommendations. However, delivering it operationally, you know, all our teams have got seven full-time uh, equivalent midwives within them. Um, but there is something around, I don't think it's enough, I do think we need an uplift. I think each team needs eight midwives in it. And that is largely around, you know, building some resilience around the team, because if we have somebody that goes off sick or somebody that gets pregnant, goes on maternity leave, um, there is no flex in the system, mm -hmm. and that then really negatively impacts on the remaining team members. So it's actually sort of building the team so they've got some inbuilt resilience to be able to sort of cope with those everyday things, you know, that happen, uh, training, um, training, et cetera, et cetera. So I am going to be going to be having to go back to my board I think, <laughs> and ask for more staffing. So it's you know, it's really thinking about, you know, what it is I'm asking for and being able to evidence why we need those staff and, and what the positive impact will be, it's quite a difficult call because we're quite early on in the journey and certainly in terms of sort of metrics and being able to demonstrate the effectiveness of continuity of care a team, you know, we don't have that evidence yet, but, you know, hopefully sort of six, 12 months from now we will. On to the next slide is technology. Uh, this has been huge, um, actually. I think at South Warwickshire we are sort of quite technologically advanced in as much as we use uh, Badger. So all the community midwives already had iPads, which was great, um, so they can work mobilely. Um, but some of the technology hasn't worked particularly well in the hub, so we have had that expense that we didn't think we would have in the hub. Move, to actually make the model work, so you sort of move one piece and you sort of unravel sort of another five things that you need to sort of consider. So because, you know, women are now no longer able to book through the GP surgeries, there is no sort of receptionist um, facility at the hub, you know, midwives are having to book, you know, within their electronic diary um, future appointments. Uh, that was a huge challenge, just so people know, getting midwives to move away from using their paper diaries, which are like their Bibles, um, to an electronic diary. So we had transparency throughout the team of, you know, kind of being able to book women into the, the hub session was huge. Um, so, yeah, I think we probably underestimated. We were like, oh, it's just an electronic diary. Here you go. And everyone was like, oh, our pieces of paper are going. <laughs> so that was quite a challenge. But it's actually working fantastically well, and, and any of the team can, can look into anybody else's um, clinics 
and see who's who's booked in. So if you do experience issues, you know, a, a midwife being off sick, actually you have all the information about who she would be seeing, you know, when that lady's due, the cohort, the postnatal care that's being offered during that day. So it makes it so much easier for the team to then cover that workload for her. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, it has been a big challenge. That, that was a really big challenge. Um, the other sort of bits of technology that we've used um, through the, we're sort of doing team coaching with all of the teams. And as a team, they all agreed that one of their sort of non negotiables really was around the importance of communication and coming together as a team. So they've agreed, um, you know, within the team that, you know, at least uh, once a month, you know, they have a large team meeting and that everybody needs to attend that, you know, whether they're actually rusted to work or not. Um, but they supported that by actually using technology. So if they are a day off, they will zoom in. <laughs> so zoom, I've learned this, it's a little bit like Skype, but I think it's much easier to yeah. actually use a new Skype. Um, so they can, they are at the meeting virtually. Um, but the communication, because things are moving at such a pace, is one of the biggest challenges, Absolutely. I think, in any sort of transformation work. So we've used lots of new um, apps and IT, really, to try and support that communication. Uh, and Zoom has been very successful. Mm -hmm. The project team used Trello, uh, which is sort of just like a managing sort of uh, project board. And we did try to introduce Slack. Um, which was really to try and put people complaining about they were having far too many emails and they just weren't reading the emails because, you know, the number of emails. So Slack is a little bit sort of like Facebook where you can like a WhatsApp, like a WhatsApp group. Um, so a similar kind of thing that you would have um, different groups for different teams or, you know, you can have one for the whole community if you wanted to, to get messages out there. Um, I think it's a, a, a really useful tool, but I think probably we've had a lot of new things all at once, and, and it's doing it kind of on, on a, a slower pace because I think sometimes when midwives are changing their, you know, their whole way of working, and sometimes it's just one more thing that is a little bit overwhelming. And although we know it will help, I think it's just taking our time to make sure it's embedded appropriately. Um, so, yeah, moving forward, I, I think it's something that will become more useful. Yeah, I respect that. I mean, as we are individualising and personalising care for women, I think with our change, you know, we really do need to individualise and personalise the change for all our midwives. Mm -hmm. And the IT was a big one. You know, some midwives embraced it very quickly. Um, others, that was probably their biggest barrier. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually trying to sort of, you know, take your staff, you know, with you, keep them on board, because it, it's the IT that yeah. you don't really start to you know, push people. Uh, if we could move on to clinical pathways. Um, so obviously with this, you know, looking, you know, clinical pathways, again, is another sort of whole project in itself. We've had new guidelines, you know, with the birth center opening and lots of, you know, procedural documents to support, you know, how we're, how we're working, um, how blood's are going to be, you know, collected and when from the uh, hub, how, how the referral pathway um, is going to work. So that's been a huge amount of work, um, just supporting those uh, clinical pathways and also setting out the expectation of, you know, following women through. So although we're supporting, you know, low-risk um, women, um, if they transfer um, to the consultant-led unit uh, because they want an epidural or, you know, labor slow down, um, you know, then the midwife uh, goes with them. And I think you know, that has been quite at times, you know, that has been quite a challenge here yeah. to say, you know, mm -hmm. just trying to change that um, culture. But certainly it, it's starting to feel better. And I, I hopefully sort of six months, it's, it's amazing how quickly things, you know, then become normalized. You know, you, and then you look back and you think, I can't believe that, yeah. you know, that was felt such a big challenge at the time. Um, so we sort of put, you know, phase one, you know, we're hoping by uh, May, or well, the last hub, so it could be between May and August now because of the delay, we would be achieving 33% of booked women on the continuity of care pathway. And, um, you know, then we are looking actually at how we're going to sort of upscale that. But what we will have in place is all those foundation blocks in terms of the hubs and the staff in the right place. The scaling up should be 
know, relatively um, easier than the first phase of the project. Just look at the last one, the antenatal. Uh, part of our model is really working, you know, much more closely uh, with our sort of public health colleagues and our health visitors focusing and looking at the sense of services in a different way, that it is just that first step on that 0 to 5 uh, pathway. So we are at the moment developing our um, antenatal sort of package. We're looking at bringing together women in, in groups, a little bit like the circling model out in the Netherlands um, and the Lexan approaching in Sweden really to get those public health messages um, in, um, but also really to create that social connectivity. Um, but things change all the time, and I had a fantastic phone call yesterday, Michelle, I haven't heard this yet, but <laughs> <laughs> with um, Dr. Rose McCarthy, who's actually been piloting some fantastic um, Facebook um, connectivity with women, groups of women coming together on Facebook, up in Manchester, um, and the results of that have been amazing because women feel that they're getting continuity of care, but you know, it's the virtual relationship that they've got with the midwife. Um, and so it's really set me perhaps thinking perhaps on a slightly different path as to how that we might pull this together um, at the um, <laughs> 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 um, Anyway, I think it's fascinating to hear really what other people are doing, you know, what's going well. Um, that, that, the whole thing is, is a learning journey, isn't it? And, and as we're going along, we, we, we pick up on something, you know, like Sarah has a conversation with somebody or, or we hear somebody else is doing something, and it's how we can incorporate that into the, the way that we're moving our, our model forward and, and making it better for the women that we're providing the continuity for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's so thank you so much, um, Sarah and Michelle, for a really comprehensive for a really comprehensive run through of um, uh, what, what implementing continuity of care means from an operational <clears throat> perspective. And Claire is, is sat here to my left with uh, many, many questions, and she's currently sharing them mm -hmm. with um, uh, Sarah and Michelle so that they, they can really um, take time to have a look at how they respond to the many questions that have come through. So um, I just wanted to give a big thank you from NHS England to our two key speakers today um, for really um, sharing with you some of the operational um, quick wins, some of the challenges that occur um, when trying to transform services in this way. And um, this is what you um, have asked for in the system. Um, can you please share? You said to NHS England, can you please share um, some of the more um, operational challenges so that we can hear from those that are moving further, faster, and so that we can learn ourselves about how to make um, improvements. So thank you very much to Michelle and Sarah for doing that. Um, they now have your questions. Um, Claire Matthews is helping um, our speakers to pull the questions so that we can be more efficient um, with the answers for the last 15 minutes of this webinar. So I'm now going to hand you over to Claire, who's going to pose some of these questions to our panel. Thank you, Jackie. And, and when the slides come out and you download them, one of the things that I would really like to point you towards is Sarah and Michelle's top tips, because um, on each of their slides, they have fabulous top tips if you haven't noticed them already. So the first question um, that I'm going to ask you, Mich uh, Michelle and Sarah, is did you have any resistance from the midwives? This is a question that's come in. Which one? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, we absolutely did have resistance uh, from the midwives. Um, I think um, early on when we did the workshop, I was quite surprised, certainly having been sort of on the BESPA panel, um, really sort of making the assumption that midwives were really aware of, you know, the evidence underpinning uh, continuity of care, and they weren't. So, you know, we really sort of started, you know, right from the beginning, sort of, you know, working, you know, building in that knowledge. Um, but I suppose in terms of in terms of the resistance, you know, yes, there was, and we're still experiencing some of the resistance. Mm -hmm. We saw very early on when we went through a formal consultation process with the midwives that we actually lost 18% um, of our community workforce. 
Um, this was something I anticipated because it will be huge change in terms of you know how they're going to be working um, pretty much from Monday to Friday, mm -hmm. nine to five, to working just like the acute midwives, um, so you know nights and days um, included. However, you know, touch wood. <laughs> Since then, um, you know that that has stabilised. Yeah. I, I also think it's worth mentioning that we did have um, there was a, a couple of members of staff who did leave because of the changes, but they said, we can see the benefits of it, we can see how the model will work, and actually we would work in that way, but we don't want to go through the change process, which mm. I think for us was quite a shock, because we thought that was their you know, moment to kind of influence how it would look at the end. But for some people, actually, that was clearly just too much for them to, to, to take on. Uh, and, you know, we're already getting questions about, well, how is it going, you know, when will you be all finished and up and running? So I think it'll be interesting to see if any of those members of staff rejoin us at some point. Excellent. Thank you. So one of the, the next question that's come in is, what would you have done differently regarding the implementation at your trust? I think the big learning for me is certainly around the engagement. Mm -hmm. um, we did, we really focused on staff, and I think we did that. But I think we did yeah. that really well, um, you know, despite the attrition rate, because I think, you know, you have, I think that was inevitable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was for a variety of reasons, and it was, you know, different midwives, different ages. There was no commonality. No. Really. It wasn't our older midwives. In fact, some of our older midwives have been our biggest supporters and advocates of the new model. Um, but certainly with primary, you know, engaging with our GPs, that's what I would have done more of from the beginning. Because um, I think that would have we wouldn't have hit so many yeah. bumps had we had them fully on board from the beginning, um, and and also sort of engaging more with uh, commissioners. Yeah, I think for me it's probably also around continuing to talk. So a lot of our time is obviously taken up with the moving the model forward, but I think it's, it's having that point of stopping, reflecting, feeding that back to staff, and keep talking all the time. I can't under it, underestimate how how much the communication with everybody, um, and I think if we can keep talking more with the staff who are still working in, in the acute setting, um, that will help with the, the transitions that we still have to come. It's exhausting, isn't it? Yes, it's tiring. It's really hard work, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, what, the next question is around what percentage of women are on your continuity of care pathway? And I know that you covered it in your presentation, so yeah. I just wanted to reiterate yeah, at so the moment. At the moment, we've got 13.2% um, booked onto um, the continuity of care pathway. And we're hoping by March, yeah, March in yeah. March, with the other two hubs up and running, that we'll be at kind of 33, 26. Sorry, go through and get to the end. So 26, and then when the last hub is online, we're looking at about 33. Excellent, thank you. And this may be a bit too early to answer this question because it's all very new. But one of the questions is, how or what percentage of women are birthed by their lead midwife? And if you don't know that yet. Well, I suppose the next question would be, what process have you put in place to monitor that? So the system that we use is uh, Badger, Badger Merit. Um, so we are working actually very closely with Clever Merit in order to be able to pull these metrics. Um, so I have anecdotally gone back in to have a look, but at the moment we can't get the system to work in the way that we want in order to pull it out by name midwife. Um, but also I think it's very mind of the model that we are using is a teamed approach. So you know as I as NHS England have outlined, we will be monitoring it by name midwife, buddy midwife, and your team. But I think you know, whilst we will be able to pull that eventually and say we easily from Badger, you know, the real test is going to be that qualitative feedback from women as to whether they feel that they've had that continuity um, of care throughout their journey. And I think this is why I was really interested in speaking to Rose McCarthy up in Manchester yesterday about really supplementing that with um, you know, that online mm -hmm. collectivity. Mm -hmm.
Excellent, thank you. And, and it's really, really nice to hear uh, some people are just posting comments and, and, and thank yous, and it, that it's great to hear from you both at South Warwickshire. So I just wanted to say that on behalf of the audience and the people that are listening. And a bit of a, a, an IT and technology uh, theme now, uh, a couple of questions. One of them is, did you receive any funding for the community teams for the iPads and IT support? I know that you said in your presentation that you were a little bit ahead, ahead of maybe some other mm -hmm. places, yeah. but how, how was that funded, or, or did you have any support for that? Well, we we already had the iPad um, in our model of care because we have been using the um, electronic healthcare records badge for um, over three years now. So um, the midwives already had that kind of technology at their hands, um, which which is fantastic for us. But obviously, would be um, a challenge. Saying that, I have just completed the business case. Yeah. <laughs> the iPad, you know, we have had them, I think, for quite a while. Yeah. Um, and so they're now not compatible with the latest release from Cabinet. So we've just had to put a business case together to replace 33 iPads, which have been approved. Yeah. Um, so I think it is that ongoing, you know, to keep that IP. The, uh, the asset the actual yeah. initial yeah. setup. Yeah. So I think one thing to share, really, from my previous experience um, of my previous role as head of midwifery, uh, as a head of midwifery and general manager, is that there are lots of digital pots of money out there available. Yeah. Um, and you just have to keep looking and, and watching what spaces are happening and there's been lots of investment in techno for people to bid for over the last year or two, and I'm sure that there will be things out there still if you if you just need to find it. So thanks for that. And the next question, really, still on the same theme, is around have you experienced any connectivity issues of mobile coverage, particularly in your rural areas? Mm. Yes, we have, both in our rural and urban areas, um, actually. Um, and I think it is, you know, generally the system works well if you're interested it live, but it's sometimes when you're trying to pull archived records, you know, that has been particularly slow, but when you're doing a booking, you know, that's quite important that you can be able to, put a, you can pull those archived records. So whilst they've all got 4G, we have actually had, you know, an unexpected cost of having to put, um, you know, PCs, um, within the uh, primary hub. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, changing the subject slightly now onto interpersonal care, one of our colleagues in the um, listening audience shared that their biggest challenge is the interpersonal care. I wanted to really know how others are overcoming and addressing this. And I suppose, Sarah or Michelle, if you could just reiterate some of the things that you've done to help with that. We've done a lot of training um, with the community team. So, as we mentioned, we were fortunate enough to um, open our birth centre in July. And um, part of the process was having um, some emergency drills within that, um, checking all of our, our systems. And actually, we really utilised that with all of our um, staff and um, took advantage of the time that we had the birth centre empty for. So um, we did a lot of um, emergency drills. We did um, a lot of discussions around kind of interpersonal care, documentation. Um, and as the teams are building and they're coming into the birth centre and providing that interpersonal care, we still have a core staff um, within the birth centre um, to provide additional support as well. Uh, and as we as we roll the program out, the core team within the birth centre will be amalgamated within our uh, team. So um, having that additional support for um, staff who perhaps haven't provided interpersonal care on a regular basis, um, to have that buddy system within the the birth centre has been um, a real positive. It's really scaffolding, you know, very scaffolded approach, um, mm -hmm. but it is transient because mm -hmm. in order to make that, we've only got the uh, five point three uh, full time core, or not core, yeah. their team, yeah. but you know they are um, just working in the birth centre at the moment, but they have been sort of integrated uh, with the team. So eventually, we'll follow the same pattern as all the other community midwives, rather than basing all their shifts on birth centre. But I think, you know, one of the things that is becoming easier with the more hubs that are going live, certainly because you've got, we will certainly in 
the um, hospital itself have more midwives than we've ever yes. had uh, before. So for your whole service, it gives you much greater flexibility mm -hmm. in order to um, really support women. Absolutely. So for example, you know, whilst we're really focusing in this pilot on um, you know, women with straightforward healthy pregnancies, if we've got three midwives in the birth centre, um, you know, but not the activity to warrant three midwives in the birth centre, you know, the midwives will actually look to see of their cohorts, you know, which women are from their cohort, um, are from labour ward or on the postnatal uh, floor, you know, and proactively go and support uh, mm -hmm. those women. So we're seeing, you know, our mantra really is one service, isn't it? Working mm -hmm. as one service, you know, really to see that sort of flow, um, you know, and it's Excellent, thanks. We're almost out of time, so I'm just going to la ask the last couple of questions. One's a very simple one, and one might be a little bit longer. The first one is, someone's asked Sarah and Michelle if you're able to share some of your rotors as examples. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. And then, I suppose this is a real big one, and it's been a hot potato, and we've discussed it in many places uh, on the tour, is how have you managed your on-call system? We don't. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we've, the, the midwives work in a way that rather than, and this was their decision uh, and, and how they wanted to work, we don't have an on-call system. So if they are onto their team, they're on a night shift, they're in the birth centre. So, and as Sarah was saying, having that flexibility is amazing because actually once all five hubs are up and running, you'll have five midwives who are on a night shift to provide that continuity of care. Um, but also that gives you the flex then that they can then support other areas if they haven't got the demand within the birth centre. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So uh, we unfortunately come to the end of our um, webinar, our second webinar. A big thank you to Sarah and Michelle for taking the time to share their um, knowledge and expertise. I am really sorry that we haven't been able to answer um, some of the questions uh, that you've posed. Um, hopefully we'll, we will be able to get to them at some point and post them on our Continuity of Care website at NHS England. There have been a huge amount of questions about the long-term plan and we will hope to address this in a future webinar. Um, we were full today with 125, 125 participants and at least 100 more wanting to join. Our next webinar is on the 6th of February at 11 o'clock, and we'll be hearing from um, Pippa Nightingale, Chief Nurse and Midwife at um, Charles Dean Westminster Hospital, who will be given uh, an Executive Trust Board perspective on midwifery and continuity of carer. During that webinar, we hope to introduce some elements of the long-term plan and answer some of your um, uh, questions that you've posed today. In the meantime, and I'll just reiterate this, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us through the usual means. Um, and uh, otherwise, on behalf of the team here, we had Jana Richards standing by, um, uh, waiting to answer questions too. We've got Charlie Podchish, who um, continues to support the um, implementation of this um, uh, um, ambition and Claire Matthews, who facilitated, and the last shout out to our key speakers, Sarah Noble and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.